The title of this experiment is Concentration Cells in the Nernst Equation, and it really focuses on electrochemistry and the conversion of chemical energy into electrical energy. So the basic idea of electrochemistry is that we can take the chemical energy of a redox reaction and convert it into electrical energy in the form of a voltage and or a current. So, for example, we can imagine a hypothetical reaction where we have a reducing agent, let's just call it R, and an oxidizing agent, and let's just call it O. Now, the reducing agent gives or donates electrons to the oxidizing agent, and so on the product side, we have Rn+, plus, where N electrons have been donated from R. Electrons are negatively charged, so now R is positively charged, and those electrons have been given to O, and so on the product side, O now has a charge of N-, minus. and what we can say is that N electrons have been transferred in this process. It's a redox reaction or reduction oxidation reaction in which N electrons have been moved. Now, in general, this is a reversible process and it's associated with some delta G value. And let's just for the time being think about the standard delta G value. The key to converting that free energy difference into, for example, a voltage involves, in an engineering sense, separating the oxidation and reduction processes in space so that electrons have to travel across a wire in order for the redox reaction to occur. And to do this, we essentially segregate the reducing agent and its oxidized form, Rn+, on one side or in one half cell or electrode, and the oxidizing agent and its reduced form, that's O and O n minus, in another electrode. We connect these two by a wire, and we can measure the voltage or the current through that wire. In this setup, electrons will flow from the side with the reducing agent to the side with the oxidizing agent. And so in this example, this is in this direction. And we know that reduction is happening over here. This is called the cathode. And oxidation is happening over here and this is called the anode. To actually make electrons flow, to make a real current show up here, we need one more component, and that is a connection between the two electrodes that allows ions to flow without a flow of electrons, and this is referred to as a salt bridge. What the salt bridge does is it ensures that there isn't very much charge buildup either in the anode or the cathode. So you'll notice as electrons are pulled from the anode, oxidation's happening there, so electrons are pulled out of it, there's positive charge building up in the anode. To counteract that, there's ion flow through the salt bridge of negative anions, let's just call them X minus, to the left. At the same time, there would be negative charge building up at the cathode as electrons were injected into the cathode. To counteract that, cations move toward the cathode, keeping the charge balanced along both sides. So this is the basic construction of what we call a galvanic cell, and it's how we convert the chemical energy, the free energy difference of this redox reaction, into an electrochemical potential. You'll see that referred to as V, or sometimes with the letter E for electrical potential difference, we can think of it. And under standard conditions, you'll see E cell with a little circle there for the standard cell voltage. And if the circle's missing, that means non-standard conditions. Now, under standard conditions, there's a relationship between delta G and the cell voltage. That relationship tells us that the standard free energy change of the reaction is equal to the negative of the standard cell potential times the number of electrons transferred, that n value is just the n we defined when we were writing out the redox reaction, times a constant that represents the amount of charge in a mole of electrons. If we think about the units here for a second, the units of the cell potential are something like energy per charge, joules per coulombs, which would be volts, for example. On the other side of the equation, the units of delta G are energy per mole. And so to make the units match, we need a constant that is charge per mole of electrons. And we can think of N just as a number, the number of electrons transferred in one instance of the redox reaction, for example. This is under standard conditions, one mole per liter of all ionic species and one bar or one atmosphere of pressure of all gases. But in fact, because the equation is really just based on the units and how the redox reaction works, it also holds 
under non-standard conditions. So we can simply drop the circle and write the equation in an equivalent form. The negative sign appears in both equations because by convention, cell potentials for galvanic cells are reported as positive quantities since positive voltage implies that we can get some electrical power out of this device, which is definitely true of a battery. While the delta G's are negative for the spontaneous redox reactions because they're spontaneous. So the signs are opposite for E cell and delta G. Now these equations are useful for example for calculating a cell potential from a delta G or vice versa. But what if we know the standard cell potential and we want to know what the non-standard cell potential is under a given set of reaction conditions? This is a very common scenario. We typically don't know the delta G value or it's just a pain to calculate. However, the way we set up a galvanic cell tells us what the conditions are. Right? We know the concentrations, for example, of Rn plus and On minus in the anode and cathode. And we can easily find the standard cell potential by looking up standard reduction potentials. So how can we, we relate the standard cell potential and the reaction conditions to what the non-standard cell potential will be? Well, to understand that, we need to go back to the relationship between a non-standard delta G and a standard delta G. And the equation that relates these two variables is here. The non-standard delta G under any conditions, not necessarily at equilibrium, not necessarily at one mole per liter of everything, is equal to the standard delta G, that's one mole per liter of everything, plus a term related to the reaction conditions. R, that's the ideal gas constant, typically in units of joules or kilojoules per Kelvin per mole, times the temperature in Kelvin, so that's the absolute temperature, times the natural log of Q, where Q is the reaction quotient. Recall from our studies of equilibrium way earlier in the semester that Q is essentially the value of the equilibrium expression under, again, any conditions, not necessarily at equilibrium, not necessarily at one mole per liter of everything. That's the reaction quotient. Now, if we take the delta G's in this equation we just wrote out and we substitute with the expressions on the right up here, essentially replacing the delta G's with E cell terms, and then we divide through by N times F, the relationship we end up with is that the non-standard cell potential now for a galvanic cell not at standard conditions is equal to the standard cell potential minus RT divided by NF times the natural log of Q. And this equation is very important. In fact, it's exactly what we're looking for. It relates the standard cell potential for a given set of components, R, Rn plus, O, and On minus, and the conditions of a particular galvanic cell, which are captured by the value of the reaction quotient, to the non-standard cell potential we would expect. This equation is called the Nernst equation. And it gives us insight into the kinds of voltages or cell potentials we can achieve given a value for the standard cell potential and the ability to alter conditions like the temperature and the reaction quotient. And so in this experiment, we're really going to put the Nernst equation to the test, varying Q, for example, by changing the concentrations of these species within a galvanic cell and varying the temperature using something like a hot plate and then measuring the effects on E cell as a result of these changes. And E cell can be measured simply by using a voltmeter that connects the anode and the cathode. So with all this kind of pre-theoretical work out of the way, I want to get into the specific type of cell we're going to be looking at in this experiment. It's actually a very interesting type of galvanic cell for which the standard cell potential is actually zero. And one of the remarkable things you're going to see in this experiment is that it's possible to achieve a non-zero cell potential even when the standard cell potential is equal to zero by playing with Q, by altering concentrations. In this experiment, we're going to be constructing a number of different galvanic cells, and there's a bit of an apparatus to do this efficiently. We're going to make use of seven way boats arranged in a kind of honeycomb pattern so that we can prepare a number of different galvanic cells and connect them to one another. So the sort of honeycomb pattern is going to involve one central hexagonal way boat surrounded by six kind of reservoir way boats on the outside. And each boat is going to contain a different solution. In the center way boat, we're going to have an electrolyte solution consisting of potassium nitrate dissolved in water. And this electrolyte just supplies ions that are going to travel across the salt bridge 
as we connect the outer reservoirs to one another. Each of the outer reservoirs is going to contain a solution of copper 2 plus in water at varying concentrations. They'll all be copper 2 plus though, so I'll go ahead and fill that in for all of these. And we're going to use dilution to vary the concentration of copper 2 plus in each of these solutions by several orders of magnitude. So we're going to start out at 1.0 mole per liter, and we're going to dilute that 10 to 1 to achieve a concentration of 0.1 moles per liter. I'm actually going to abbreviate that as 10 to the negative 1 moles per liter. We're going to dilute that 10 to 1, 10 to the negative 2 moles per liter. We're going to dilute that again, 10 to the negative 3. Dilute that 10 to 1 to achieve 10 to the negative 4 moles per liter. And then finally, we're going to dilute that 10 to 1 to achieve 10 to the negative 5 moles per liter. And copper 2 solutions are ordinarily blue, but by the time you get down to concentrations this low, you may notice the blue color being very, very faint or even unnoticeable. Now recall that to build a galvanic cell, we need both the reduced and oxidized forms of both of the species involved. And so we need copper metal, which is copper zero, in each of these cells as well. So we're going to use a strip of copper metal. This is copper zero in each of these cells to serve as essentially the reduced form of copper 2 plus. And so I'll just represent that with a red rectangle kind of dipped in each of the six outer cells. What we're going to do from here is connect the cells on the outside through a salt bridge that goes through the central electrolyte solution using filter paper. And I'll just represent the filter paper in green. So for example, if we wanted to connect the one molar copper 2 solution, this one molar electrode with the 0.1 or 10 to the negative 1 molar electrode. We would just put two strips of filter paper from those half cells into the central electrolyte reservoir. Now those cells are connected. And the question is what happens when we connect the two copper metal pieces with a wire and measure the voltage here? Will we observe non-zero voltage? What is the E cell here? Ignoring the concentrations for a second, if we look at what's going on here, we've got copper and copper 2 plus in one half cell and the same species in the other half cell. So the redox reaction that would occur if electrons were to be transferred would be something like copper plus copper 2 plus goes to copper 2 plus and copper metal. And, and just to clarify this, you know, this copper zero on the left hand side becomes copper 2 plus on the right hand side and the copper 2 plus on the left hand side becomes copper metal on the right hand side and so electrons are actually being transferred but it's very clear from the nature of the reactants and products in this chemical equation that the value of delta G under standard conditions has to be zero. Right. If we think about calculating this through any sort of means, Hess's law, standard free energies of formation, standard enthalpies and entropies, we're going to get delta G equals zero because the products and reactants are chemically identical. That means that the standard cell potential here is zero. However, going back to the setup here, what we actually find and what you will find in the lab when you connect these half cells is that you will observe a non-zero cell potential here. And that's pretty remarkable, right? Because the only difference between the half cells is the concentration of copper 2 plus in one versus the other. The way we can think about this working is that copper 2 plus on the left-hand side of the chemical equation has a concentration of 1.0 mole per liter. But in the other half cell, this co copper 2 plus on the product side has a concentration of only 0.1 mole per liter. That means that we can calculate a value of Q for this system. And when we do that, we'll realize that Q is equal to 0.1. And if we think back to the Nernst equation, we'll realize that even if the standard cell potential is zero, we can still achieve a non-zero voltage under non-standard conditions as long as Q is not equal to one, which would cause this second term to be equal to zero. And so what happens is that because Q is equal to 0.1 in this example we're looking at. The right-hand side is not equal to zero, and E cell, as it turns out, comes out to greater than zero volts. And you'll measure this in the lab. This type of galvanic cell, where the reactants and the products of the redox reaction are the same, such that the standard cell potential is zero, but a voltage is still observed because of a difference in concentrations, is referred to 
as a concentration cell. In the first part of this experiment, you're going to be asked to think deeply about the origin of the non-zero cell potential. And of course, we've seen it here in the form of the equation. But I, what I really want you to think about is what is the deep chemical origin of this term? What chemical phenomenon is responsible for that term? And to really understand this, we need to think on a somewhat deep level about thermodynamics and why. What is the driving force for the movement of electrons from one cell to another? One question that's worth contemplating with this cell that we've created right here is which direction will electrons flow? If you can answer this question, you're already well on your way to understanding what the driving force is for a concentration cell. So I'm not going to answer it here only because it's worth thinking about on a deep level. After constructing this concentration cell, we're going to explore two relationships between variables in the remainder of the experiment. First, we're going to look at the relationship between the non-standard cell potential and Q, the reaction quotient. And of course, from the Nernst equation, we can see that this relationship should be essentially logarithmic, where a change of Q by a power of 10 in other words, increasing it exponentially causes only a linear increase in the cell potential. That's the theoretical expectation, but we'll see if that actually gets borne out when we construct our galvanic cells. And in the second part, we're going to look at the influence of temperature on the cell voltage, essentially by building a concentration cell using beakers and heating those beakers on a hot plate. And we'll look at the influence of temperature on each cell. Now again, from the Nernst equation, it looks like an increase in temperature should have a linear effect on E cell. Again, that's the theoretical prediction of the Nernst equation, and in the lab, we'll see if that theoretical prediction is actually borne out by the data.